Hi, this is Ben Llewellyn. Today I'm talking about the name Llewellyn. Some of you have down in the comments occasionally asked me what that name is or where it comes from or if I'm Welsh and so on. Well, I'm going to go into that today for you. The name Llewellyn is all over the place in Welsh history, mainly the early bits, so we're going to go all over the place. In this video, you are going to get an explanation of the different people in Welsh history of the name Llewellyn, because a lot of people tend to get them confused, or they don't know that there's more than one when referring to one. So, seeing that no one's done a guide yet to the Llewellyns in Welsh history, I'm going to do that for you now. There are a couple theories as to what this name means. Well, a third one, but it's not really accepted at all. It was more medieval ages. They thought it meant Llew, lion, which that's not really accepted. It's kind of bogus. But the other two theories, one theory is that Llewellyn comes from a fusion of two different Celtic gods, Lugus and Belenus. Lugus is kind of a god of light and shining and brightness, and he actually gave the French city Lyon his name. The Celts were all over Europe, a continuum of various tribes. I'll do a video on that sometime if you're interested, leave a comment below. The other god is Belenus, and this is linked often to a character named Beli, which is kind of a father god, war figure, and sometimes seen as a god of light. If he was a god of light, it's kind of strange that you have two of these deities. On top of that, the reason why I don't generally buy this theory that much is that Christianity came into Wales quite early. And so by the time we have the first Llewellyn, which I'll get to in a moment in the 10th century, there may have been earlier ones, fair enough. We don't have that much written evidence for the period before the 10th century, but that's a gap in our history of well, six centuries from when Christianity was really coming in to Britain and the first Llewellyns appearing. So I don't really buy that theory that this name comes from these gods. It could, because we don't know, the theory that I tend to agree with is that Llu means uh, to steer, and it was meaning more of one who leads in battle, Llewellyn, that Y in ending denoting a, a, a man or person who does whatever it's attached to. So Llewellyn, the one who leads, Llewellyn, that's what I think it means, the one who leads. I put it on the name of my channel. Yes, my name is actually Benjamin or Ben, but I chose Llewellyn as the other name because I wanted something quite a bit Welsh as I'm living in Wales and I love the Welsh language. And because if we're going to build a community here at Ben Llewellyn, I'm kind of having to lead the way and bring people with me. Now, what about people who were actually named Llewellyn in history? How can we give a clear menu of who these people are? This list is not extensive, there are going to be plenty of others, and I'm covering mainly the early bits of the Welsh history. So we're going way back to the 10th century, there was a man named Llewellyn at Mervyn. The name in English, Marvin, does come generally from Welsh, Mervyn. But that's another story. Llewellyn at Mervyn ruled over the Kingdom of Powys. We don't know much about him, but after the year 942, in his death, Hubal Va, Va meaning good, took over his kingdom. He was his cousin, so he just kind of went in and said, well, that's over now. You know, in the medieval times, family went off and stole things from each other and killed things and people. In the next century, after a period of prolonged warfare, a Llewellyn arose named Llewellyn ap Seisich, and he seized power from a usurper, Aivan ap Blagirawid, in the year 1018, killing him and his four sons. It wasn't a peaceful period in history, so he took the throne of Gwynedd and Powys, quite a significant chunk of Wales. Four years later, He's found an imposter in the south, Rhein or Rhein. 
he was an Irishman, we think, but he may have been a Scotsman pretending to be an Irishman so that he could claim the Welsh throne. In any case, Llewellyn Absesic went down to Dehebarth, the southern realm, and took the guy out and claimed his kingdom. A year later, Llewellyn died, but there would be another Llewellyn coming along, quite a few. That Llewellyn had one son, Griffith Ap Llewellyn. Now that app, that's a patronym that shows the passage of the family. You can do surnames in Welsh today, of course, but there's still the patronym form and both are completely valid. If it's in front of a vowel, like Owain, Abowain, the son of Owain, that P changes to a B. Good if he that Llewellyn was quite an angry king. Let's not confuse him with another Griffy that Llewellyn who fell from the Tower of London. I'll get to him in a bit. Or Llewellyn of Griffy, who was Llewellyn the last, though he wasn't the last Llewellyn for me to note in this video. Griffy that Llewellyn went around killing basically everybody in his path. He actually has a quote mentioned that he spoke when he says, don't talk to me of killing. I am plucking out the thorns of Wales, which would kill its mother. So his mission was quite clear. He was trying to save Wales from killing itself with intermittent civil war. And he just basically said, well, if you're going to fight each other, I'll kill all of you to unite the country. And he was the King of Wales all of it, more or less, from the year 1055 to 1063. A Welsh historian I'm quite a fan of, John Davies, said that this was a feat because it's something that no Welshman has done since, nor had ever done before. Unite all of Wales under one crown and have people accept him as the King of Wales. That was quite an achievement and it never happened again. And that's why Gurifi that Llewellyn is important. In the courts in this period, you had the role of a pentele, which was basically the war chief, the head of the war band of the royal court. And the pentele of Griffith of Llewellyn was a Llewellyn, Llewellyn Aradorchog. And let me explain what that second word means, because it's not an app ending, is it? Aradorchog means the golden talked one. Air is gold and torch is kind of a golden necklace, not necklace, but it's, it's a golden Celtic thing that's quite common in the period. And the og ending is a descriptive saying that it's golden of this. So Llewellyn at Dorchog, and he was rewarded by Gudafid ap Llewellyn for his loyalty and received lordships. He appears to have died along the same period or time frame as the death of Gudafid ap Llewellyn and Wales was plunged once again into a long period of civil war. A century and a half later, you get two brothers who were named Llewellyn. Llewellyn Heen, or Llewellyn the Older, and Llewellyn Yai, Llewellyn the Younger. We don't know much about these two brothers, but we know that they agreed to fight alongside another Llewellyn, Llewellyn the Great, or Llewellyn Vaur. And Llewellyn Vaur would go on to rule Wales, or most of it, a good chunk of it, for 40 years, being the dominant guy in Wales. He changed the laws, he built castles, he innovated the court system, the military system, and got recognition from different kingdoms like England and those in Ireland of his being Prince of Wales. Reigning for 40 years in Wales was no easy task. Most people were killed after just a few years. This guy lasted 40, this guy lasted over 40 years at the top of his game. That's not easy. He died in the year 1240 and he had a son named Gurifida Llewellyn. But he chose his son David to rule. And Griffith, through a bit of mistake and betrayal, ended up in the Tower of London. And he tried to escape, I guess, to take back his kingdom. And he fell from the tower and died. And that's the end of Griffith at Llewellyn. But just to go back to those two Llewellyns, those brothers, the older and the younger, 
Huel and Heen, the older, actually launched a quite significant dynasty of his own through his descendants, who actually survived the English conquest, which is quite significant. Not a lot of aristocracy in the northern kingdoms of Powys and Gwynedd outlasted the English invasion of the late 13th century. So that by that time, you get a name like this, Llewellyn ap Llewellyn ap Meredith ap Llewellyn ap Meredith ap Cynan. There's quite a few Llewellyns and his descendants, and these were major lords at the time. But he also had another who became Madog ap Llewellyn, who led a revolt against English rule in 1294. Then you get Llewellyn ap Griffith, not to be confused with Griffith ap Llewellyn. Llewellyn ap Griffith is Llewellyn the last, though he's not the Llewellyn of the last in this video. Llewellyn the last, or Llewellyn ap Griffith, fought two wars against Edward the Psychopath. And Wales didn't really have much of a chance to fight against this because at the time England was, well, stretched between Scotland and the Pyrenees in the south of France and Wales was basically outnumbered by 30. That's not a fair fight. Llewellyn ap Griffith died in 1282. He was the last native ruler of Wales born into that position. Llewellyn ap Griffith, or Llewellyn the last, had some significant poetry attached to him. One of the most heartfelt ones in the history of our language is the eulogy of him in which it's basically marking the end of the, the Welsh Kingdoms period. As his death comes on, this poem describes basically the apocalypse happening. The Welsh no longer have their indigenous kingdoms. Everything changes. But there's still a few rebellions that happen in attempts to gain Welsh independence from the English during that period. Like the Madagat Llewellyn fellow I mentioned, that rebellion happened just over a decade later. And then 20 years later, you had Llewellyn Bren. Bren means of the wood. That mutation there, it comes from P, Bren, wood, Llewellyn Bren. And he fought a short-lived guerrilla war in the, what would now be called the Welsh Valleys. He laid siege to Caerphilly, but didn't quite manage to take it and realizing it was a bit futile, agreed to give up, basically. Llewellyn Bren was the descendants of the Lords of Singhenith. About a century later, you had a rebellion under Owain Glendur, and he was about to be caught by the English, but there was a man named Llewellyn at Gurvid Vechan, and that ending, Vechan, gave us the surname Vaughan later on, and what it means is small or short in stature. And what Llewellyn at Gurvid Vechan did is he led the English on a goose chase, saying, oh, he's over here, he's over there. Let's go down this valley. We think he's down there. This is the way, the best way to go. And it let Owen Glendur get off the hook. They never caught him. We don't know what happened to Owen Glendur in the end. He vanished, though that happened sometime later. This is directly as a result of this Llewellyn Ogrifid Vechan fellow outwitting the English and allowing him to escape. But Llewellyn Ogrifid Vechan, for this, loyalty to his fellow countrymen was executed. There were not just warrior chiefs, kings and princes named Llewellyn, though it was obviously connected with being of royal lineage. There were poets, and poets in Welsh culture had a significant standing. They were kind of the propaganda officers of their age, giving exploits, reciting how good the chief was, or the prince or king, and they could even insult them as well. So the princes did not really want to offend their poets. Before the conquest period, there were the Bear of the Toesogion, which means the poets of the princes. And there were three Llewellyns in this period. There was Llewellyn Vard I, Llewellyn Vard II, and Llewiarch ap Llewellyn. <laughs> But Llewellyn Vard 1 and 2 is not very creative. And Vard comes from Bard. There's that changing of the F to the B there. 
and Bardd is the word for poet in Welsh. The, the way to tell these two Bardd, Bardd is more than one poet. How to tell them apart is that Llywelynvarth 1 came before Llywelynvarth 2 and Llywelynvarth 1 sang to a couple guys named Owain who ruled different kingdoms, Powys and Gwynedd. Llywelynvarth 2 had a very strong connection to the ruler of Powys, Gwynwynwyn. I'll put that here for you so you can see how it's pronounced, Gwynwynwyn. But he was also a poet for Llywelyn the Great. They like to travel around, you know, like like today's sports stars tr trade different teams. After the fall of the Kingdom of Gwynedd in the 1280s, after that, in the mid 14th century, it really began to change. And you had a poet named Llywelyn Goch at Merighen. Let me explain what this means. Llywelyn Goch means red. So Llywelyn the Red at Merighen. Old Merig. So Red Llewellyn, the son of Old Merig, was this poet's name. And he sang a very important poem called Llegi Llwyd. And that name Llegi Llwyd has quite a significant place in Welsh literature and culture today. There's a song Llegi Llwyd and it's, it's quite a poignant heritage that he gave through his poetry to Welsh culture in her. The new of Llewellyn Abamoyle, which Abamoyle, this is a bit unusual, Ab, son of Amoyle, the bald. So we don't have a name here, we just have, we just have Llewellyn, the son of the bald. So I guess his father didn't have hair. These nicknames for people keep becoming the standard name is quite normal because in Welsh culture there are so many names which are the same. So you've had to differentiate which Llewellyn do you mean? Llewellyn Abba Moel, Llewellyn the son of the bald. But Llewellyn Abba Moel, there's a strong suggestion that he was actually partaking in the national revolt of Oanglandur. So that's one way to remember this Llewellyn was not that Llewellyn because he was part of Oanglandur's rebellion. He has poems about his time as an outlaw along the English border, which is really, it's quite interesting, I think. Just over a century later, Llewellyn Ap Sean came along and he was a bit different from other poets that we have evidence of, not because of his social standing, he was very much a man of the gentry, a copier of manuscripts and a solicitor, which is quite typical in many ways of his age. But because he came from Morganuk, the far south, and that he appears to have really liked French. He copied some very valuable French works into Welsh. He's also connected with quite a, a funny character, Yolo Morgano, later on. Llewellyn Sean was a poet of the age of the gentry, towards the end, when things were winding down, but he still gave quite a significant contribution in his copying of manuscripts in Welsh. I hope this clears up anyone's confusion about which Llewellyn is which Llewellyn or that it doesn't confuse you further because there's quite a few Llewellyns that are very similar to other Llewellyns. If you want to learn more about those, hey, leave me a comment below or a question. I'll be happy to talk with you what I can about that. And I'll give you some information about some of those historical figures below. Thank you very much for watching. Dio and we'll see you next time in the next episode.